Shaped by anything? I'm not sure that they've been cha shaped by um, the Holocaust experience. Um, I feel very strongly in Israel. My daughter, whom you just met, lives in one of the settlements near Hebron. It's a settlement that's completely isolated. I'm very much concerned of what's going to happen, so I'm very much to the right. Um, I very worry about Israel, but I think all of us, whether Holocaust survivors or not, have a right to worry. When they use imagery like in 67 or 73, where we surround and you know, the Holocaust, that, I mean, how do you think about those kind of... Oh, 67 was awful. Because we were living in the United States, and it sounded like there was no Tel Aviv, and there was no more Israel. And uh, I cried bitterly, but again, I think that most of us did. And uh, sometimes I wonder, I've got a lot of mixed feelings about, should all the Jews be in Israel? In some ways, I think, yes, this is where we belong. And the other place, you sort of feel, isn't it dangerous to have everybody one place? If anything happens, we're all wiped out. But when I went back to Poland, and when we were in Russia, we just took a cruise this summer in Russia, and they're talking about revival of, of Judaism. Um, I don't understand why anybody would want to stay in Poland. I mean, you can't have the same kind of life that we have here, and everybody's welcome to come here. Um, why not take a chance, advantage of it? And then you sort of feel as somebody who's old and who doesn't speak the language and who has family there or has intermarried with Christians there and coming to, to the unknown is very, very difficult. So I don't know if we can afford to be judgmental about it. But I, I, I'm not sure that, that if I were given the choice of reviving the Polish community there or um, encouraging them to come here, I think I would encourage them, very much to encourage them. Here. Well, I think um, it's my hair, my hair. Just one last thing, in terms of maybe your, your life after, um, were there any events that really made you feel brought back to the, um, the show to you or made you feel more in your life than at other stages of your life? I told you the Gulf War was terrible. I seem to have taken it harder than, mm -hmm. than my husband or my children. Mm -hmm. um, I was very careful following orders. When they said to go to the sealed room and put on your gas masks, we did exactly as we were told. And somebody came to visit us one day without a gas mask, and I was quite upset because I said, you know what, I don't want to give mine to hers, but how do I sit there if there's anything happening and just let her be without it? And, you know, they, they what's the big deal about it? Nothing's happening. Anymore. I took it very, very seriously. I told you I stocked up on food galore. Well, every kind of can that I could possibly buy so that we had for the next few years, but I thought, why take a chance on it? And it just seemed to me a smart thing to do. I thought that people who weren't taking it seriously, you know, it was very, very frightening. I couldn't understand, you know, like when they, they gave you the gas masks with um, anthrax and run to the hospital in case it happens. I said, you know, this is crazy. If anything happens in my house, the doctors in Sharit Senegal aren't going to be waiting for me because they're going to be in the same boat. Because I didn't realize that a scud just goes for a small area. It sounded to me like a bomb that just wipes out all of Israel. That's the way I, I pictured it. It was a terribly, terribly frightening. Did you feel that your family understood your fear? They understood, maybe, but they didn't go along with me. I told you I wanted to take my grandchildren out of the country. I wanted them to have passports. Not all my grandchildren have passports. Not, they, they just don't think it's that important, and they're not about to leave, and if they have to fight, they're going to stay and fight here. Well, as I said, the adults could do that. There, there's no way a two-year-old child is going to fight, and so why, why keep them here, and why keep their mothers busy with them? Um, their feelings were very different from mine, and I couldn't explain it to them, and luckily the war didn't last that long that we had to make any decisions. But nobody left and everybody just took it in stride. And thankfully it was okay. This time, I mean, nobody, I guess I didn't take it so seriously either, even with gas masks. Mm -hmm. When you had children? When I had children? Did they?
Well, I, w I was really very thrilled. I mean, I had two miscarriages before I had children, and the idea that I wouldn't have a family was um, very, very upsetting, and I didn't know whether I couldn't have or what. Um, the fact that I had children, I think, is just marvelous because it's a continuation, and it's showing Hitler that we're, we are going to reproduce, we're here, we're proud to be Jews, and he didn't succeed. I mean, when I think that God saw some of these, some day these children will be married and have children of their own, I mean, it sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Emotional. That's right. That's right. I'm ready for that. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. Of course, come the bar mitzvahs and the weddings. And the <laughs> yeah. Right. Is anything else you'd like to say? I don't think so. But if you have questions, you can call me afterwards. We can just. Well, I'm saying sometimes you have to think about whether you, you remember something or if you've read about it or you've been told about it or your um, uh, outlook is different. And, and it's not always clear. It's not always clear cut of, of what you remember. There are certain sounds, there are certain smells and tastes that you never forget. But specific details of things, you're not quite sure. Example. Well, I can remember the smell of the Bergen Bells and soup. If, if you pass um, the back of a restaurant or a sewer, that was that smell. And even if you're dressed up and going to a, a beautiful place, and you're certainly not thinking of the kind of soup you had uh, 55 years ago, when you smell that, that comes back. I think that's a subconscious kind of deal. But sometimes when you hear of, um, of instances of something in a movie, you say, did this happen that way, or did I see it that way? Do you remember something? Well, it's Spielberg's movie, you know, when, when um, that the, the commandant was shooting down at people working. Um, in the glass factory that I worked in, I, I remember shootings, and I remember the dogs who were always, every time they would be let go, um, they could really wall somebody. I've got some scars where I ran away from a dog, and um, you say, is this the same dog? Do, you, do I remember this dog, or did the movie bring the scene back, or am I imagining it? But there's no way that you can for sure remember or know that you're remembering or saying it, but it sort of triggers something in you. Um, it's cold. Cold is something. Sometimes you go out and you start shivering, and that kind of a shiver is something that you remember always being cold. I don't remember ever being hot, and I'm sure there were hot days. But I just remember the cold all the time. And it's a scary kind of cold. And then you say, all you have to do is put on another sweater or another coat or go inside the house and you won't be so cold outside. Every once in a while you have to tell yourself that. Then no. No? No. No, at that time I, I can't remember that. But at that time, even if you would tell yourself, it wouldn't help. No. And I don't know if you had the first sweater. I remember once doing something, sometimes I get scared. Uh, um, I was working in the glass factory and I was in the barracks with all men. And I was a child and I had been warned that if the German soldiers would come in, or if anybody would come to inspect, they would try to hide me and I must keep very, very still. And I guess somebody apparently came in, and a man with a big mustache, Somehow, other, I always think of these people as being my uncles, but I have a feeling that they weren't really biological uncles. But instead of calling somebody Mr. or Mrs., you would, everybody would be an aunt and uncle. And he put me under his feet in his bed with a blanket over it, and he had his feet on top of me. And I was fast asleep. And you know how when you're fast asleep, you don't know what you're doing? And I was moving. And nobody noticed, and they left. But when they left, this man picked me up and started shaking me and said, do you know what you could have, all of us could have been killed because we were doing, and you know how bad you were, and you know how, 
and and I, I remember feeling so um, I was so guilty. I was I really was bad. I really could have put everybody into danger, and it frightens me to this day of what I could have done. And I had really no control over it, but it was my fault, absolutely my fault. So somebody, you know, suddenly something happens like that, and you, oh, how could I have done that? And um, so those things happen. This morning I was changing the baby someplace, and it was a very narrow ledge. And I kept on saying, stand very close and don't let go for one second, because you can think of, of what can happen. And that's the kind of feeling is you, you really have to be careful, because you're going to be so bad, you're going to be so, um, you're going to endanger somebody so much. One time I think the Swedish man who gave me a doll, I broke the doll. The, the, the leg came out of the socket. I don't know if I had done anything, but it used to be on rubber bands, like, and I was so scared of that because of what I had done. Because you always have to think of your um, role in things. I'm not telling you anything. Else. Now, when I go, when I go to to these places, if I speak to the people about politics, they're perfectly happy to talk to me. If I talk to them about traveling someplace, if they've gone back to Poland. But if I'm trying to find information, they don't have any. Many of these people, by the way, came to Israel before the war. They came from Ketrika, but they came before the war. They lost a lot of families there. They, they, they try to be helpful, but um, we're on different wavelengths. Because they want to get over it, or because you're an American? I think because I'm an American, and they just can't imagine. It's very hard for them for somebody not knowing my story. And of course, when you meet somebody, you can't say, oh, by the way, let me first tell you about myself, and then I'll ask you. Mm -hmm. So it takes a while. And if I go with Naftali Lavi, and Naftali would sort of say, you know, she's looking for something. There, there is a bulletin that comes out, and I, I get it very often. And in that bulletin, several years ago, I wrote to the editor, and I told her my story. And I said, maybe you would print it, and maybe somebody would recognize the name. And it's like we never lived. Mm. Nobody seems to know us. Mm. So, you know, if a whole family was killed and all the neighbors were killed, who's left? There were 15,000 people. There were 15,000 Jews living there. So it's not too likely that you're going to meet your next door neighbor who would have remembered. It was so amazing what the Christian woman remembered. Anyway, we were talking about, um, so the other thing, the other thing he talked about as a theme was nature, trees, birds, barbed wire, fences of bodies. Now, I don't think I told you that, but every day in Bergen-Belsen, when we'd get up in the morning, we'd sort of look around to see who died. And of course, an awful lot of people died. And they would be pulled out on a blanket and just dumped with all the other bodies. And there were fences made out of not stone or wood, but bodies. You've seen those pictures of piles and piles of bodies. Mm -hmm. And and that was a normal thing for me. I didn't know that that was not an everyday kind of sight. And you'd go on and on. And apparently when I give testimonies, and as I talk about the fences and the smell of the bodies and, and being all around, and, and at liberation, their bodies all over, and we have pictures of them in Yad Vashem. And he says that, um, oh, also in Treblinka, there are now trees. Have you been to Trinidad? Mm -hmm. So you know those 17,000 tombstones, but around as you go through, they're beautiful trees and beautiful forest, and those were all probably grown, with, fertilized by the bones mm -hmm. of people. So when you talk about nature, so he, he brings that in. Mm -hmm. I don't know how he does it. I haven't seen him, but he says this is what he uses, and that's and in each time, I must say different things. Do you remember losing someone in Berlin? Are you someone dying and then being taken away from you? Oh, sure. That mother of mine who stole the black coat, mm -hmm. she disappeared, so she must have died. But Bergen-Belsen was not an extermination camp. Where people died of sickness and starvation. Did you feel a lot? I mean, did you feel that? Yeah. Somehow or other, I think that that was just another thing that happened. It was happening all the time. Mm -hmm. And if you read books about it, I don't remember my doing this, but if somebody died, 
you'd put them out, but you would take their shoes, or if they had any leftover bread, or if you had anything else, you'd use that. Do you ever think, I don't want to be laying up like that? Or do you ever, did you ever have that consciousness of surviving versus dying yourself? I don't remember. But I think everybody always wanted to survive. Otherwise, you couldn't go on. And when you read about people who are called Muslim, when they stopped caring, they did die. Yeah. I mean, I wanted that soup so desperately, no matter how vile it tasted. And bread, whatever you know it to. I can't imagine nowadays that anybody would eat moldy bread or drink water from a, a pool that people use to go to the bathroom or to to wash out or wash their feet in or something like that. And that's saying, and how could anybody survive drinking that water? And yet, that's all there was. Okay. You still have an acute sense of smell and... Yes. My husband says that I'm the only one. <laughs> I come into the house and I just say, say there, or see, there's something in the refrigerator that doesn't belong. Or, or, or the gas. I, I mean, he, he says that it's, it, it's, it's amazing. And it's true. I mean, I go in, um, into any of the rooms and, um, and I can find things very easily, too. Like he says, you look in the refrigerator and he can't find anything, or in the closet, and I seem to, to be able to find. I never thought about it before. Is that something that you build up? I don't know. Maybe either you people have a sense of smell. It's very yeah. strong. It, it seems to bring you back to the experience. I think. So, smell and memory is something that's uninterrupted. I have a very keen sense of smell. It's a very uninterrupted memory. So there's nothing you can really do to take it away. It's, it's, it goes it's straight registered from the nose. He the laughs brain. about me. He laughs about it all the time. When I say there's something here that doesn't belong there, or this is there, or, or these socks aren't clean. Uh, how do you know they're over here? They have, they're not. I'm, I, yeah, I do. I do. Excuse me. <laughs> I remember when I came to the United States on a ship passing Ellis Island and getting off and um, a family picked us up and there's so these big apartment houses where you may have 20 families living in one but I believed that each person had a house like that because I had not, you know, I didn't know any differently. Yeah. And, um, and, 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 you know, the schools and the, the various clothes and food. I mean, this was a totally different experience that I never had. And so what it's like going to America from the different backgrounds, and again, he brings this up because his students come from different backgrounds. You have people here who come from the Midwest, and you have people here who, who come from New York and the East and from religious homes and non-religious homes, and you bring your background into something completely new. And as you come, you, um, you see different things around you. Do you see yourself as American, Israeli, as I? Um, I guess I'm both now. I'm both. Everybody in Israel thinks of me as an American. When I go back to America, I'm in Israel. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing that he mentions is belief in God. And and what I said to you is that I believe in even if I don't understand. And the role of each generation. The generations before gave it to us, so we must pass it on. Good values, less confusion. Again, coming back to um, to Tadaka and Shabbat, value of living in a community, you and others, and the passing on of a previous knowledge. The next topic he talked about is return to Poland. And he felt that it would be an in interesting way of starting, because I told him, I never know how to start when I have to go to speak to a group. Mm -hmm. And very often something happens that you'll start that way. Or like the other day I told you, this man introduced me to his Christians, and great, that was a good way. But if, if somebody just sort of said, like, you meet me in a quint, mm -hmm. um, then how do you start? And he felt uh, one of the topics is to say, I want to tell you how I learned about this. Mm -hmm. And go into it chronologically, start with first memories of things that you remember before the war and go through, which is pretty much of, uh, of what I do. So I thought this was very nice that he gave this to me. I'm great. And then here I have also, I took a course 
um, of what, I don't know if this is going to help you in any way, but survives questions. Um, if you start with a group, is how many of you have ever met a survivor? So you sort of know, mm -hmm. are, are there grandparents of ours, are there parents? Mm -hmm. um, this group of Christians wanted to take a picture with me because they had never met a survivor and they wanted to show somebody what a survivor looks like. You know, we think it's funny, but for somebody who's never seen it, I guess it's not so funny. Um, if you have, have you ever spoken to any survivors to ask them personal questions? How many of you would like to meet a survivor? What frightens you most about a survivor? What would you like to ask them? These are questions of, that, that, that you would ask kids. Are most survivors religious or not religious? Why do you think they would be one or the other? Are the same questions you're not prepared to speak about? No. At least I haven't been asked them yet. One of the things that people ask me very often is, do you feel guilty? Mm -hmm. Because there's this notion that survivors feel guilty. And my answer is that I think I was too young to have done anything to feel guilty about it. I just don't understand how I say at least better people and smarter people and more educated people did not. But uh, it's not as if I really stole somebody's food so they died, or if I exchanged myself with somebody else, or if I was a prostitute. I mean, these, or I was a capo. These are the things that you could feel might make people feel guilty. I didn't have any opportunity to be any of these things. That's why, as a child, it's different. Mm -hmm. Don't you think so? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, I mean, yeah, and do you think that someone should feel guilty? I mean, if they were a couple? They might. They might, if you feel that you... Uh, um, I think the story of... Um, 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 in the Ludge Ghetto, Romkowski, versus um, in the Warsaw Ghetto, um, Chernikov, yeah, where Chernikov said he was not going to play God to choose the people to go to their death, where Romkowski felt that by doing that he would be saving others. And that speech he made about uh, when he sent off the children, and he said sometimes you cut off a limb to save a life. It sounds good, it makes sense, but you are playing God. Now he also felt because some people feel because of him they are alive, and other people felt that they sent my child away. So you could feel good about somebody. If you stole somebody's shoes, and you had shoes, and they were they were barefoot and they died of pneumonia, you can feel good about that. You think that is the deal that you? I mean, can you judge that? No, I think most of the things are, you can't afford to judge. We have pictures in Yad Vashem where there's a child lying on the floor and people are passing by filled with some things. And you sort of say, how could people just pass by and see this child starving? Well, if you've saved every bit of money you have and you've got ten children like that waiting for you in your apartment and they're in the same condition, are you going to give to a stranger rather than your own child? And when you see this on every block, you really can't afford to judge these people. And then Kofi? I don't know. I don't know. He really believed that if the Jews would make themselves useful and that the Germans would use would need them to make their uniforms, that they wouldn't be killed. And he truly believed that. And for a long time it was true. They didn't take off the people. But when he saw that the, he had to send away the old and the sick, and the, uh, he, he knew what was happening, but by that time I don't think he had a choice of doing it. I certainly wouldn't want to judge him. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about it? So I, I've been very confused here. I, I feel I've been any right to judge. I, I mean, I have no concept of anything of what it meant to be in that period of time at all. And so for me, I just, I just, I don't even think about judging them. I do think, but I think that it's a balance there. There's something that we should avoid in terms of uh, moral bankruptcy. In the sense that there, there were some people who gave their lives to save people. And Winkowski decided to give over people. Or there was a couple who informed on the Gestapo. They had, yes, there is 
different behavior and, and you want to find your reward the man who saved or the woman who saved or he people at the risk of their own life. There is there is a different difference going on between behaviour. Mm. And where so where where did the judgment come in? It's a very hard question. Mm. I don't think I could judge either case. But totally, something happened to me recently that sort of uh, made me something to think about. A friend of mine went to Holland. Her husband was a psychologist and she went along with it. It was a conference of some sort. And um, she came in, she's a religious woman, and she had her hair covered. She was wearing a hat all the time and she, they wouldn't travel on Sabbath and they wouldn't eat non-kosher food. And people weren't very friendly to her and she felt that there was sort of anti-Semitism. And there was one woman who really sort of snubbed her. And it just sort of turned out that they were always sitting at the same table. And one day she started talking to her, and she said she'd love to see a little bit of the country. And the woman finally sort of said, you know what, I'll take you because I'm going through. Then she got to talking to this woman, and she, she said, you realize I'm an Israeli and Jew? And she said, yeah, I realized that all from the beginning. And, and she says, you don't like Jews very much, do you? And she says, no, I don't like Jews. They ruined my childhood. And so this friend of mine said, how did they... How did I ruin your childhood? And she says, my parents took in Jews, took in Jewish children. And I wasn't going to play with other children. And I had to share my food with them. And, 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 and my mother had to give more attention to those children than to me because they were in more danger and they couldn't go to school. So when I went to school, they were busy with there. And my whole life was taken over by these Jewish people. And you know, when you think about this, it did ruin her childhood. It was a different kind of thing than if she could run outside and say, my cousin came to visit me, instead of not being able to say that there are two Jewish children hiding in my basement. Mm -hmm. never thought of it from that point of view. You just think of these mother and father being sisters. Now I realize what my parents did, but at that point, I hated it. Mm -hmm. It's true. A different perspective. A different perspective. But I, I would probably feel the same way. You know, if I had one lollipop and my mother said, you've got to cut it in four because the other children need it, I'd be resentful, wouldn't you? Mm. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to bring any friends into my home in case they would find out. I wasn't allowed to tell anybody about them. In your personal understanding of how you present yourself, is it trying to you want to improve your why? I don't know why. A lot of people have asked me why. If, if, if people ask me to come back, I must be successful in what I'm doing. But I'm always looking for something to make it better. And I also would like to know what is the best way of presenting it to make it interesting and to make people understand and to make people feel. Why don't you think they do? I'm not saying that they don't. I'm not saying that they don't, but um, I guess it's just some kind of insecurity maybe, or maybe really just wanting to be the best you possibly can. Mm -hmm. I'm, I mean, my husband, I've got the greatest husband, and he thinks I'm terrific. And if I ask somebody for a recipe, he says, why do you need another recipe? You've got so many. But you do want another recipe. <laughs> you want something different, and you want... I don't know if it's updated. My story won't change. But there's, a, there's, a, there's this realization of these Christian people. Mm -hmm. I never thought about it before, but it's an absolute truth, and you should think about it. Yeah. And when I told you that Paul Lips told me that I said these things that he's using it, I didn't think about them until he said it. So you may hear of something that I said, or I didn't say, but you say, you know, you ought to point that out. But it's amazing that you're so open for it, I mean, that, that you really want to do. Oh, I really do. I'm not saying, you no, know... No, no, no. I'm just wondering why. That's why I when I said to you, if you hear something that you don't like, and you said, why do you want to hear that? Mm -hmm. I do. It, it's just just like I want somebody to say, you know, you know, this piece of furniture would look much better over there than over here. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll say, I don't agree with you. Well, you know what? Maybe I'll try it. I can't say this picture of your story that I've I mean, that, that's your life. It's your story. I mean, what? So it doesn't speak to me because whatever. That's... I'm not going to say... No, but you could sort of say, you know what, if you describe the Bergen Bells as soup, or if you tell me how this is, I, sometimes I take a group on a fast day, and they're hungry, and I say, you know, I know you're hungry, and you think you're hungry, but you really don't know what hunger is. I don't think we know anybody living in Israel now who is hungry and starved. 
just can't, you can't explain that. I don't think I could explain it now. If I haven't eaten for the day, I know I'm hungry. I'm famished. But it's different when you haven't eaten for weeks. And what you eat has no nourishment in it. Yeah. How do you explain it? I guess a good writer could, or somebody with a good, um, a lot of good adjectives. I've never written my story. When people ask me why I don't, I don't have the confidence to write it, and I don't know how to write it. I guess I could get a ghostwriter, but I feel that there have to be so many details filled in, and those have to be so accurate.